So uh, welcome uh, to our, uh, our next session. Um, so my name is uh, Timothy Douglas, uh, if, you have, if you're just joining us. Um, this uh, is, a style, is a language and science um, sort of conference. As a part of our project, we've also been having a uh, podcast series on the holistic integration of um, languages into science and science into languages. And um, I'm going to tell you about this today. Um, how did we start this podcast series? What, um, and you know, how did you know, we come to this uh, conference today? And then I'll talk to you about the people that we talked to in this podcast series. We had interviews with, we were, in a way, we were doing what we were just doing with, uh, with Benjamin on stage. We were, so the, our guests were sharing their personal stories of um, how, you know, language learning you know enrich you their lives and you, their careers and i'll tell you about our findings and then also a sneak preview of the first findings we have of a, a new podcast series a silent global podcast series where we've extended our original podcast so why did we decide to have a podcast at all about holistic integration of languages into science and science into languages okay well, <clears throat> why do we have this initiative at all? Well, as we've said many times uh, yesterday and today, languages and science are mistakenly perceived as being two separate things, um, as if there was a fork in the road between languages and science, you either do one or the other. But we're trying to show today that the brightest path occurs when you do both of them, that languages are good for science and science uh, is good for, for languages. Now, there are some unholistic attitudes there. As I mentioned, you know, you do either do one or, or the other. And an irony, I think, of um, the scientific world that I noticed is it's very international. So if you look at Lancaster University, our faculty of science and technology, I think is the most diverse of all the faculties. And we're encouraged to be you know, mobile, we're encouraged to work together with other countries, but languages are not discussed or the rule of, is, it's almost as if they're invisible. And as we've also discussed today, science is often seen mistakenly as being something independent of languages. So we had, just as mathematics is sometimes seen as being independent of languages, science is also thought of as being the same. And often people who teach science don't have the language skills in order to highlight, you know, these um, uh, uh, links between language and science. And likewise, language teachers also lack scientific knowledge, you know, and that's also why a lot of university uh, language degrees, in my opinion, don't suit people like me who are also interested in, 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 in science because they're aimed at a different you know, audience. So, we had to start this discussion, so you know, Derek and I organized um, uh, these two conferences on language and, and sciences and the second one about fusing languages and science in teaching, okay? And thanks to uh, the audience and thanks to all of you who are listening online as well, we found that there is an interest both at Lancaster and more globally in seeing the two, um, the complementarity of these two um, areas um, being combined, okay? And then last uh, uh, year, we had a third conference on holistic integration on, of the two. We had a conference and then we followed it up with a, a podcast series. So you might be thinking, why a podcast series? Well, one reason I believe languages are undervalued is because the value is difficult to quantify, okay? So you know, if you win a grant that's worth $2 million, people imagine two million dollars much more easily and then you know you get the two million dollars when it appears in your bank account or whatever but then how when do you measure you know the positive impact you know of languages because you might start learning french today but the real enrichment to your life might come three years later and it's just as valid but you know is somebody going to wait around three years in order to mention to, to measure that you know or it might come in one week or it might come in five years all of this is valid 
but there's no proper time to measure. You know, personal stories are also good. You know, <clears throat> at least we it's a, a kind of qualitative evidence from people, so as if like case studies. And also, if we interview enough people, we'll have a large enough um, group of interviewees to make some semi-quantitative, you know, uh, deductions. Okay, but also, I think the stories are most inspiring. You know, so just as you know, here on stage, we talked about how languages and personal stories, how languages impact our lives. Um, your stories can, are things that people can, the an audience can relate to more easily. They're more memorable, you know, they're more interesting, connected with so many other topics besides just language learning itself. And often you know, we all as individuals have complex relationships with languages. And often the more we know, the more complex it becomes, and the more, more specific the relationship to each particular language becomes. You know, and you know, every individual, of course, has a unique story. So we had uh, three uh, guests. We had uh, Francesca from psychology. We had uh, Erika Fulop, a colleague who's a French teacher, and Lara Varmelink from uh, psychology, all at Lancaster University. The second group, uh, these were external people. We had uh, Stephanie Costadinova, uh, so a YouTuber and a polyglot, actually in from business, but actually a lot of what is true for business is also true for science. And we had a Cesco Reala uh, from in, works in Switzerland as a mathematician, and Marlus Peters, uh, a Dutch as a researcher now in Newcastle, working in biomaterials in my area. And then we had two anglophones. We had this dubious character here on the right, and we also had a professor, Mark Jorgen, um, who's uh, who, teach, who lectures in physics at uh, Newcastle University. Okay, so what did we find from these eight people? Well, one recurring theme was that the English that's spoken between Anglophones is often not the same as the English spoken as a lingua franca, of which Anglophones are usually unaware. So most people are not taught how to you know, speak their own language to a wider audience of people outside their country. And for that reason, ironically, I, Anglophones are often difficult to understand in at international conferences because they don't have practice in speaking English you know, as a lingua franca to these audiences. Also, it's sometimes said that English is a universal language in science, but you know it isn't. The way in which people speak English will be often influenced you know, by their own culture. So uh, English is spoken by people from so many cultures. <laughs> and sometimes you need to know how to interpret what people are saying, or what they mean, with knowledge, you know, of that particular culture. Okay. Also, you know, language is linked to identity. Interestingly enough, the Anglophone interviewees, we found that it, for us, English is not a great part of our identity. So me, myself as an example, and Mark Jürgen, you know, le being language learners is actually, yes, it is a part of our identity, but the fact that we speak English, you know, less so. However, the non-Anglophone interviewees said, yes, our first language, it is, you know, a bigger part, you know, of who we are. And the experience actually of living and working in different languages, we don't use all our languages for the same purpose everywhere, some for work, some for family, etc. And so that's one uh, Consequences: We may not feel completely at home in all situations, you know, even our first language, because of this you know, mix. But it does open new perspectives, and you, uh, the appreciation of strangeness of one's own languages, as Thomas was saying earlier today. Wer nichts von anderen Sprachen weiß, also kennt seine eigene nicht. If you don't know your own language, you don't. If you don't know other languages, you don't, you know, understand, you know, your own. Yeah, and as my favorite quote: English is a strange language. <laughs> Yes, it's a popular language, and it's very strange because it's often not learned due to interest in the people who speak it as a first language. It's learned as a lingua franca to communicate with non-Anglophones, learn it often to communicate with other lingua franca. And it's often pushed as some uh, sort of key to or, so say, a passport to the world. 
but as I like to say, it's a passport, a second class passport to the world, because English is not like every language, English has limitations. Often the limitations of many languages are the number of people who speak it. Now, English is much pop more popular, many people speak it, but it has, you know, as a result of this, some disadvantages. And I think personally, a lot of these connected with false expectations about, you know, what you can do with English or false assumptions about the role of English, you know, in the world. So, for instance, one uh, question I'm sure you've heard, why learn languages if everyone speaks English? Now, objectively, that's not true. Only a minority of humanity speaks English. But it's this attitude, we're reducing language to transmission you know, of information. And then something we also encounter, some disregard of local languages. So everybody in science speaks English, so it's no point and we shouldn't have to you know, learn any other language. You know? And then also uh, uh, something that came up and um, what I call you know, English switching. Languages can build bridges with it between people, but used inappropriately, they can also build walls. And I, I think everyone has, will have experienced this at least once in their life. You go to a country, you speak their language, and this you receive a reply in English. And what does it do? It makes you some, it may make you question your ability in the language, but it may make you feel not taken seriously and make you feel treated as a foreigner. Okay, and this is a case of how using English inappropriately can actually not strengthen a relationship, but it actually, you know, it can sort of push people further apart by accent, accentuating their foreignness. What's the value of language learning? Well, <clears throat> lang as we've been talking about before, we talked about vulnerability and uh, um, language learning does involve leaving the comfort, comfort zone, and it's also a sign of uh, interest, you know, in other cultures and other people. And as Mark Jürgen said, employers should ask about this more. They should be more interested in language learning as a sign of the attitude of language learners. Also, in career progression, you know, even it's possible as a PhD student or even as a postdoc in you know, Western Europe, at least, to speak only English, the higher you go in academia, the, you, the more important the language becomes, you will have to teach, you may have administrative duties, and these have to be done in the local language, you know, English is not enough in such situations. And also, as we've said many, many times during this conference is the connection, you know, science is done by the scientists who are humans, and your collaboration is based on you know, relationships. So anything that's good for interpersonal relationships, you know, such as you know, uh, human human interactions, you know, like language is good. And you can make actually a better connection with people, actually not by using English, but actually by using their language. You know? So firstly, I'd like to sort of thank our three you know, interviewers, you know, Peter, who you may have seen at dinner yesterday, Katarzyna Martinkova and Agnieszka Dukowska. So they did a really good job very independently to interview all these people and do you know, more interviews. We have another bigger Sailang Global podcast series in the preparation. Um, one thing that we would like that we've had mainly scientists who are interested in languages. We'd also like to have more language experts who are interested in science. What we also need to de develop, I mean, we talked about, um, you know, we've had, as you said, Derek, we've had a lot of discursive, you know, um, um, um discussion but within how can we you know you know, you know build a, a sort of a structure and it may to convince some people to help us build this structure to support language learning we may need tools which will allow a more quantitative you know measurement of the value of languages and also a strategy to apply the findings you know to demonstrate you know this that science and language are connected and encourage actually you know people you know to learn languages i mean we can all use be an example as it were of the change we want to achieve and you speak more languages and tell people about it but i think you, we may need a sort of a, a more um sort of coherent you know strategy to make sort of you know systematics of change okay finally thanks to the people who gave us our money good news is we get the, the longer this lasts the more money we get but um um i just want to and this is uh, again self-promotion but i just wanted to show one finding from the new series. So we've interviewed about um, 
uh, eight, eight, we have about eight interviews so far. At the end, there should be 15. And one common question that we try to ask all our guests is, what do you think about the dominance of English in the scientific world? Is it something positive that brings us together? Or is it something like negative, you know, like a restriction? And interestingly, <clears throat> all the interviewees see sort of both sides. But interestingly, the positive re the reasons why it's a positive thing seem to be nearly all the same. But we get a lot of different answers about the, the negative aspects of English. So <clears throat> the positive aspects, I think this is something that is you know, very widely known. If more people speak the same language, it's easier for them to exchange you know, information with each other. That is undeniably one positive thing about English. Everyone said that. <clears throat> one interview, he said there are many resources in English. So if you want to learn other languages, you can learn them via English. English, the way of writing, is preferred by some people to the style of writing in other languages, especially uh, apparently in Spanish, scientific writing is very long. But I think the negative aspects of English are also very interesting. Now, a big part, actually, I think, of promoting languages and science is actually making people aware of the limitations you know, of English. It's not an attack on English as a language in itself, definitely not, but rather you know, the um, to dispel you know, false, I think, assumptions that about, you know, the what you can do with English and also making people aware of the its limitations. So again, not everybody can or wants to speak English. Funnily enough, a lot of people who have learned English as a second language will still, you know, express this idea, oh, I can just go abroad and everyone will speak English to me, even though that's not the case in their country of origin. But, you know, as one interview, he said, there's a lot of business in science. You know, you need to engage with people in their language you know, so that they will feel comfortable. And also there's a perception that English is, will be enough all the time. No, that's not true. Not everybody will want to speak to you in English all the time, even if they can. Uh, what's the, the second one <clears throat> is you know, the connection with people. As one interview said, you know, you cast a spell on people if, you know, you can speak, you know, their language that, to, in his words, puts them in your good, good graces. And that's actually, that's, <laughs> if you speak Polish to people, you'll know what I mean. As you know, unfortunately, English is the weakest spell in the spell book. People will understand it, but it doesn't have much of an effect on them because they know English, so what? Um, there are different you know, microenvironments and audiences in science that you need, you need to adapt to. And there's one of the nicest things about science, you have this great cultural diversity. And in order to appreciate you know, all these different cultures, you, know, you need language to appreciate them fully. And some people talked about a double language barrier. So if you speak English to somebody, you have broken one language barrier. But if you speak to them in their language, it's as, as if you break through another barrier and you can have a much better relationship with your other people in science and sometimes better scientific discussions in their languages because they feel more comfortable in expressing themselves okay okay and another um, negative side of english was exclusion of uh, english uh, compared to was how english excludes excludes other language so this idea of you know, so actually i think we've talked about this today in in the conference as well of diaglossia you have the one language for science and then another language for, I think, as you put it, Thomas, buying your meat and vegetables. Yeah. Uh, and also, you know, there are different ways of, you know, ex explaining concepts, you know, in different languages. Uh, a few people said this. And if you restrict yourself to English in science, you're, it's, you're restricting yourself to one way, you know, of, you know, expressing science, one way of looking at the world. Okay. Again. Uh, English isn't necessarily an ideal language because it's not necessarily the best language to explain all your scientific concepts. It's a strange language because its pronunciation is, is, is irregular. Its uh, spelling is quite irregular. And also, if you have one language in science, not all voices are going to be he you know, heard you know, equally you know, in it. Some people, you know, I mean, sometimes I hear people saying, well, English is good. It's, it's, a, it's a foreign language for everybody but it may be more foreign for certain people than for other people as well. So 
you, everyone using English is not to use an, an English expression, a level playing field automatically for all. Okay. Uh, yes, um, also the, because of English's dominance, sometimes learning of other languages is not uh, promoted. So, you know, British people don't see the relevance of, well, not English, of other languages to the life. And um, maybe because one reason, I think you know, it would be very helpful if Anglophones learned to speak English as a lingua franca. They may find it hard to empathize with that because they haven't learned, other, many of them haven't learned other languages themselves. So, what we would like to do, it would, <clears throat> how, the big question is how can we encourage more people to learn more languages? Um, and one thing that one of the interviewees said is really encouragement to actually do what we just did earlier today is to, for people to share their stories of language learning and how it impacted their lives. But it is actually one of the best ways to promote language learning to see you know, the positive changes that happen in somebody's life as a result of language learning. So if you see somebody else you know, doing something, you're more likely to try to do it yourself. Okay. So finally, I'd like to uh, finish with my favorite uh, uh, metaphor. What we're trying to do here is to, to, to kill two birds with one stone. You know, we're trying to show you know, languages are good for science and science is a good for language. And if you do both, then it will be better for your science and for your languages. Okay, so thanks very much. I, I hope I didn't run over time too much. Okay. Thanks very much indeed, Tim. And uh, uh, we are a little over time, but it was well worth it because you, you gave us really great ideas then. We've, we've had some comments in the chat from Sri John, who's agreeing with you and pointing out that the, um, uh, the, the power imbalances uh, in, in terms of different languages uh, uh, that can become very pronounced, such as in colonial settings where uh, 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 colonial masters established and implemented yes. and imposed a kind of language hierarchy upon people. And then uh, even in non-colonial environments uh, where one language is imposed, such as in China, uh, as the dominant uh, uh, language, uh, then as we heard yesterday from Yan Shi, that uh, uh, local languages are disempowered and uh, even threatened with extinction. So the, there's a lot of uh, interesting comments in the chat. I don't think we have time to go through them all. So uh, thanks very much, Tim, for that uh, update on your, 